In this video, I'm eating a pumpkin, pitching a documented camp from the 18th century, testing a bunch of new gear, cooking up a fall harvest feast right on my campfire, and a lot, a lot more. A deer just ran right through my camp. You're not gonna wanna miss a second of this. Oh man, it's dark out here. It's ironic to me that fall, nature season of death, is always the time of year that brings the most growth in my personal life, and that includes this hobby. Since my last video, I've spent more than $1,000 on new gear, and it's led to some giant leaps forward in authenticity. But the biggest leaps forward have been my college graduation, my new job, my new place. You know, I really appreciate this community because some of you have watched me grow from age 18 to now stepping off into real, true adulthood. The times you've looked past year-long gaps in content, you've still checked in on me on social media and here in the comments section. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. A product of all that growth in my personal life has been launching this little shop right out of my own apartment. From this room, I'll be able to take this channel to the next level. In fact, I've already launched my own blog and a store online. And on the storefront, I'm gonna be dropping video worn gear with the tag as seen on YouTube. It's top quality gear made by my hand. The proceeds go to support the channel and it's immortalized here on YouTube. That's three points of value in one product. I'm really looking forward to getting more gear uploaded to the storefront. But besides the store, like I said earlier, I'm launching my life. I've got a dream job, my first place, and I'm loving these first steps into adulthood. Now for this camp, I'm running a new bedroll system and I'm really excited about it. It's largely dependent on these. These are hand-woven wool blankets by Rob Stone. They'll be paired with this buffalo hide here. Now if all goes well, this is the same bedroll setup that I will then carry into my winter camp in another few months. I'm really looking forward to getting out in the cold, wet, nasty Ohio wintertime and pushing myself in those low temperatures the same way that guys would have been doing in the 18th century. They couldn't choose the season, they couldn't choose the weather the way we do today. These blankets are gonna open up half the calendar year to my being able to get outdoors and pursue this hobby in an accurate manner. There's so many people that mark off those months as time to sew, time to work on their outfit for next year, not me. We're getting out there, we're gonna stay in this mode of continuous improvement. I don't wanna lose momentum as it starts to get cold out. I've shared a gear review video before, but I haven't ever shown how it all comes together. The first step is laying out your bedroll. For years I've used a piece of oil cloth, and a lot of people do, but lately I've been trying to cut this out of my kit because I don't think having oil cloth is feasible for most frontier characters. It seems like a reenactorism that's kind of crept in on us. For this camp I'm using my buffalo hide, and truthfully, a blanket is all that most guys had, so if that's all you've got you shouldn't feel bad about it. Fortunately I've got three new blankets to test out, so I'm adding those next. And now it's time to start getting organized. These are market wallets, they're kind of like the plastic bags of the 18th century. They're super common and really easy to make. Carrying two market wallets allows me four main sections to pack in. The first is for dry foodstuffs and for my mess kit. The second is for wet foodstuffs, if applicable. And I'm adding my canteen to round out the necessities of food and water. Now, second to those, my biggest priority is my feet. My third section is for my extra moccasins and my spare socks. Finally, I've got some other gear that I won't need during my hike in, like my journal, an extra fire kit, and a candle, my leather patching kit, and my Hussif sewing roll. And now it's time to get accessorized. My tomahawk, powder horn, shot pouch, and some documentable accoutrements that go inside are all gonna get laid out. My belt and knife will join that pile as I start to lay out the clothes that I plan to actually wear on my person, like leggings, garters, socks, moccasins. I've got to think pretty critically about what I want to take based on the weather. You'll notice that I kicked my mittens and hat into the market wallet with my socks. And with everything laid out, I'll sweep across the gear in an initial mental checklist to make sure that I've got everything, and then I'll actually pack. My market wallets absorb most of my gear, and anything that I'll carry on my person goes into a basket for easy access once I get on site. Any clothing that I'm not wearing but still want with me gets tucked into the bedroll. I'm trying to even out the weight and mass of these market wallets for a good tight roll. In this case, I'll end up rolling my gear a few times. You want this as tight as possible so that you're not suffering under a saggy bedroll on the trail. It's totally okay to take a few minutes to rearrange and tighten things up now so that you don't have to do it later on in the woods. You'll notice that I roll the end of my buffalo hide into itself to help keep rain out, but it's mostly out of consideration for ticks, which could otherwise crawl directly into my bedding if I set my things down. And last, I'll do one final check among all the gear that I didn't already pack. In this case, I found my turn screw and vent pick in my shooter's box and put those inside my shot pouch. 
I caught daybreak on the road the next morning and made it to the forest just after sunrise. It's peak leaf weekend in the Hocking Hills region of South Central Ohio, almost Appalachia. This was the proud home of the Miami and then the Shawnee and later Frontiersmen. It was paid for by both sides in blood. I'm fiercely proud to call Ohio my home, and it truly is an honor to camp on this land, especially during hunting season, mind you, where I'm safe from hunters without having to wear blaze orange thanks to this being private property. I owe a huge shout out to the property owners. Thanks, you guys. Well, you might recognize this place from before. This is the rock outcrop that I filmed my most recent video in. And unfortunately, the enormous white oak that lived directly above this rock outcrop has given way in a few different segments. And it's left this massive, massive branch hanging down over the outcrop that I had camped in previously. This great big fallen tree reminded me of a period account that I read one time, and I can't for the life of me remember who wrote it. But this guy, younger guy, uh, maybe first or second trip out onto the frontier, and he's with a group of a little older, more experienced guys who have kind of done this sort of thing before, some long hunter frontiersman types, and they're camped about 15 or 20 feet away from where he is seated, under a tree with a branch hanging out above him. And somebody in that camp yelled over to him, say, hey, you might want to move out from under that branch. And he kind of shrugged his shoulders, looked up, hey, the branch is alive, you know, it doesn't look too bad. Somebody else in the camp, though, yells over and says, hey, you might move out from under that branch. I really don't like the look of that. And so this guy now, a little younger, there's a, kind of a, a funny dynamic at play. He doesn't want to um, make him any more awkward. So he kind of humors his friends. He moves out from under that tree branch. And before he can even get seated in their little camp next to the fire there, that entire branch wrenches off of that tree, snaps with this loud crack. And what happens is there's another tree branch from a nearby tree about like this. And so the tips of that branch smack onto that one. And what it does is it cranks that branch down and around so that the big, sharp, fractured off end of that thing drops straight down into the ground and plants itself four or five feet deep exactly where that guy was sitting, not four or five seconds earlier. And immediately the entire group, wide-eyed, hearts racing, they're all looking at each other, they drop down and pray. I love that story because it speaks to the complete random will of nature. You could come out onto the frontier expecting to struggle against starvation, against nighttime raids from any number of uh, members of European empires that are out here trying to dominate this land, from American Indians who are out here protecting their homes. You could expect to struggle against all of those things. Bad weather, no moccasins, cold, snow, wet, sleet maggots in your jerked meat you could expect all of those things but a falling tree branch could be the thing that takes you out and that just to me is kind of the romance of the whole thing there are so many uncontrollable variables and you've got to be at peace with that in order to really enjoy yourself out in the wilderness especially during that time period I think a sorely overlooked piece of campsite selection criteria in modern times is security. In a howling wilderness, as Daniel Boone called it, you make the softest target at night. To that end, I chose to follow a deep ravine so that I could sleep with my back to it. Ultimately, everybody's sight is up to personal preference, but those personal preferences were the differentiating factor between the masters and those whose bones ended up bleaching on the riverbanks. Those who had been in, you know, some nighttime ambush situations and stuff, would probably have real strong formed opinions about exactly where you want to set your campsite. Fortunately, I don't have those experiences and uh, I'm able to sit down right here and pitch camp. The camp that I'm pitching was documented by George Bettinger and he was a tough dude. This guy was born in Pennsylvania in 1756, moved with his family to Virginia when he was six years old, and was living in Boonesboro, Kentucky by 1779 at age 23, which means he would have been about my age when he went on campaign against Chillicothe that May, a primary Shawnee settlement in Ohio. He went on to see the Battle of Yorktown, St. Clair's defeat, and then continued his service as a Kentucky senator, during which time he freed the slaves that he inherited from his brother and offered to pay their passage back to Liberia, and one of them accepted. He was a seriously rugged, interesting guy with simple, strong convictions about what was right and wrong, and he backed him up. Nathan Kobuck revived his memory for me in a Buffalo Trace 1765 blog article, where he quotes from Bettinger's Frontier Journal. 
Bettinger writes that a blanket stretched upon poles sheltered them from the storm, while a good campfire served the double purpose of cooking their bear meat and keeping them warm. A little camp kettle, a pint tin. Kobuk has pitched this camp many times before, and he adds some helpful commentary in his article. He discusses using bullets to fashion grommets at the corners of his blanket. The only change that I'm making is using a few poles to support the blanket, and instead of tying off the corners to a stake, I'm just tying off onto the poles themselves. This camp went up in a leisurely 10 minutes. I highly recommend it. You can call me George Bedinger. This is a pretty nice setup and I'm feeling confident going into the evening with this. You'll notice two things about this site. First of all, the back of my shelter is pretty well open. And second, I did not build a real thick bed of leaves underneath my bedding here. I'm not too concerned about the temperature tonight. Frankly, I'm camping in 18th century luxury. I got three wool blankets, a buffalo hide. Most people that I'm reading about in period accounts had a single wool blanket. They made a great big bed of leaves or else they used a bunch of brush and then put their feet towards the fire. And if you can get into that while you're still feeling pretty warm, you'll probably be able to fall asleep in relative comfort. Natural body temp drops a little bit when you're asleep anyways. Maybe you wake up in the morning feeling pretty cold or worst case, wake up at night, stoke up the fire, throw some more wood on. Either way, folks were cutting the nights out of the frontier with a lot less than what I've got here. And so if anything, I'm, I think tonight I might be a little too warm, but I did really want to get out and test this whole setup before I'm out here in the winter time with these same blankets, this buffalo hide. I didn't want to do it for the first time when it's real cold and maybe I'm wet and it's dark and the stakes are just a little higher in the winter. With thoughts of that winter camp in mind, I said about grabbing some rocks to build a quick fire ring. I'm pretty particular about fire. I take it real seriously, especially on private property where I'm intent on leaving no trace. Not everybody was abiding by those principles in the 18th century, but you need to today. Dig a hole and contain that soot. Bonus points if you heap the dirt so you can bank the fire in an emergency. So I'm moving a little fast here to try and get this going. Instead of using flint and steel, I'm just gonna snap the lock on my rifle. In the time period, I just read an account of a guy who dabbed a little bit of tallow onto the touch hole here. I've heard of guys using feathers, sticking a feather into the uh, touch hole as well to keep the charge in the rifle from going off. In my particular case, there's no hunting or shooting allowed on this land. I pulled this right out of its case and took it right out into the woods without ever loading it. So I'm very confident snapping this that nothing's gonna go off. But you need to be very, very careful if you choose to use this method on a hunt or any kind of activity where there might be powder anywhere in the nearby vicinity that you don't have a charge in your rifle. So be very, very careful doing that. I don't have a period correct ax yet, so I'm using the fork in these two trees to break up as much hardwood deadfall as I can find to get a good hot bed of coals. I'm not planning to keep this fire burning beyond my dinner, so I'm going to grab wood and feed it as necessary without collecting a big wood pile. While I root around for that hardwood, I'll also select two forked poles and one live branch to use as a spit. So it's finally time to eat. I've got a pumpkin a sweet potato, an onion, an ear of corn, uh, four apples, a pear. I got this squash here, as well as flour, some chocolate, some tea, some of the basic 18th century items that I usually carry. Uh, but maybe most importantly and most exciting are these two big buffalo steaks. I'm really, really excited to cook some buffalo over the fire. Ohio used to be full of buffalo. Some folks call them woodland bison today, I think is the proper scientific term for them. The American bison used to be all over the place. And we're talking in Ohio to the scale of hundreds of thousands. There are major highways in the state of Ohio today that follow exactly buffalo traces, which is where thousands and tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand buffalo would all run down the same trail together as they migrated throughout the state to eat different foods as the seasons changed and things like that. They carved out these huge paths through the wilderness and those became known as buffalo traces. Buffalo traces were some of the war paths that various American Indian tribes followed there. Some of the paths that delivered pioneers like Daniel Boone into land here in Kentucky, Virginia, Ohio, there's so many frontier states that had those bison. They used to be all across the entire continent. Today, they're thought of more as a thing of the American West. In any case, we're gonna get this bison onto the fire first.
With my first round of buffalo over the flames, I turned my attention to carving this pumpkin for a pumpkin soup. While I worked, the fire became my dominant light source, and I realized the early autumn evening had crept up on me. I got up to get more wood and got back to cooking just after sundown and right as the first bit of buffalo was ready to eat. It's like this meat was made to be cooked over a fire. There's no way to know who the last person to cook buffalo over a fire on this land was, but I sure felt connected to him as I ate those first bites. That connection, that spark of inspiration, is what living history is all about. You can watch those musings, bloopers, and more commentary in my hour-long behind-the-scenes film on Patreon. I'll leave a link to that in the video description. With my next bit of buffalo on, I turned my attention back to my soup, which is a recipe I found on the Townsend's YouTube channel. The Townsend's channel has, to a scale of millions, brought people into this hobby through food. And what a cool meeting ground between two worlds. Our historical world, this world of reenacting and living history, it doesn't have a lot that we can relate to people in modern times, but everybody eats, everybody cooks. So when you start to make videos about food from the 18th century, it attracts a whole new demographic of interest, and Townsend's has been fantastically successful leveraging that. So if you're curious about food, go check out Townsend's. For this case, what you need to know is that I don't think frontiersmen, long hunters, were running around with a market wallet full of pumpkins and gourds and uh, corn, maybe a potato, feasible, onions, okay. But when you start to add things that I'm about to pull out in this recipe, like eggs, milk, and butter, deep out on the frontier, you're increasing the unlikelihood of that dish existing exponentially with every ingredient that you start to add. So you have to suspend disbelief here. This is something I saw on the Townsend's channel that really just lit the fire in me. It made me wanna give this a shot. So I've got a pumpkin here and I have hollowed it out. Uh, pop the lid off like you would with a jack-o'-lantern. And I took the guts and things and put them into my new kettle from Hot Dip Tin. And um, I'm just gonna add a little bit of water to this. And my intention, and you know, per directions from the Townsend's video, is to bring this up to a good boil. And then I'm gonna let this boil down into almost a marmalade. Just, just pure pumpkin and water together. While that heats up, my corn, onion, sweet potato, and squash are going into the fire. For every fresh vegetable that I toss onto the coals, this meal gets exponentially more unlikely. Then once my pumpkin boils down, I'll be adding milk, butter, and egg yolk, which pretty much totally rules out this dish for a frontier campfire so meal. So now I'll stir those in. This fall feast might not be perfect for this time and place in history, but the kettle that I'm preparing it with is. This is the small size Wapatomica kettle sold by Hot Dip Tin. It's a three cup kettle based on an original excavated at Wapatomica, a Shawnee village in Ohio where Simon Kenton famously ran a gauntlet in 1778, located only an hour from where I'm camped tonight. Kenton himself might have laid eyes on the original that this kettle is inspired by. So it's kind of a difficult proposition to both be cooking things on coals in your fire and also be trying to boil something at the top. So I'm kind of trying to keep some flames going more in the back half of my firing and just nurse these coals along more in the front. What I can tell you right now from the things that I did throw in, that onion already smells amazing. I can tell it's roasting up real quick on those coals. The squash, the skin is starting to kind of model a little bit. Uh, potatoes getting charred, the corn is getting charred. That's to be expected. So I'll be pulling those out here. Collapse. And this looks right. like it's getting plenty of heat. All the vegetables are off the way through. And this pumpkin soup is boiled down to a marmalade. Now this required milk and butter, which like I said earlier, highly unlikely for this part of the country in this time period. But I'm bending space and time to make this French pumpkin soup happen on the American frontier. So there's my plate. Things have finally cooled off. First, I'm gonna try a little squash. I have not had squash in years. I've certainly have never cooked one over a fire the way I did tonight. I was actually pretty surprised. It was great. But it's sweet. It's got a great, great texture to it. Wow, I love that. Next, I'll try the sweet potato. It's tough to get a big spoonful without all that char on there. Man, that cooked up well. That's got the same smoky tint to it that a bourbon has. Now, the onion didn't take in any of that smoky flavor. It was actually really sweet. The onion almost has a a flavor and a, a crunch to it like an apple. And it's got a sweet kind of aftertaste to it. That tastes entirely different roasted over a fire like that. Very, very impressed by that. Finally for the corn. That's got a little bit of grit to it. 
the uh, top of that <clears throat> top of the cob there was open a little bit. You can see it got burned up pretty good, and uh, some ash definitely made its way down in there. This just goes to show that these campfire meals out here in the woods, they don't have to be all gritty flour and jerky or jerk as it's called in 18th century context. You know, if you just threw in an ear of corn or a squash or an onion, something real simple that folks conceivably could have had, sweet potato like that is, that's great. It just goes to show you throw in one thing like that to spice it up, every other bite, some sweet corn. Oh man, that's awesome. You can't beat this. And of course I gotta save the buffalo for last. <clears throat> it's the best part by far. But man, oh man. I mean, you can, the fibers in there, it's a good dense meat. It's just delicious. It's awesome. I just wanna eat this in little bites and savor it. Really, I just had a sampler. I've still got the other halves of my squash and onion to eat alongside my soup which had finally boiled to the right consistency. I poured it into the pumpkin bowl and set it by the fire to loosen up the flesh and the pumpkin itself. And that's pretty hot already, but about half of that pumpkin, the interior of about half the pumpkin right now is mushy. I want the other half to get a little mushy too. I'll take it off. I don't want this whole structure to break apart. I wanna be able to hold it, but I wanna be able to scrape some of that vegetable up into the soup as well. After a few minutes, it was finally time for the main course. It smells great. That's good. That is good. Oh, the French knew how to cook. Well, right as I was finishing up my food there, a real good rain picked up. Took me by surprise. And I keep seeing a couple of flashes of lightning out there. So I've pretty well let the fire sputter out. I'm not going to try and keep it alive now. Yeah, there's some some thunderstorms rolling through out in that direction and seeing flashes of lightning i can hear that rumble <clears throat> i'm just catching the tail end of it i'm gonna let the fire die i'm gonna try and get some sleep and uh i'll let you know how the blanket did in the morning little did i know as i tucked into my buffalo hide that the passing storm wouldn't be the only thing keeping me awake in October, coyote pups leave their parents to find a new pack with new territory. Biologically speaking, it's what ensures genetic diversity throughout the species, but it causes a tremendous upset. Pups trespass into other packs, parents go screaming out after their young. It's a high testosterone uproar, and I didn't realize it, but I was in the middle of it all, with a big pack to my north and another to my southeast. Now, there's no reason to fear coyotes, but all that yipping and howling sure is eerie at this magnitude. And having just cooked up a great big campfire feast, they certainly knew where I was. Once I had bedded down, one came sniffing around about 15 feet from my camp before I called out and spooked it off. Well, I just woke up. There was a woodpecker pecking away at this tree that my shelter is tied up to. So that got me up. And I was sitting up, starting to move around, thinking it's time to get this morning sequence underway here. So I was about to set the camera up. And right as I had sat up to do that, this deer came plunging through my campsite. I've never seen anything like this before. I'm on the edge of this ravine here. And so that deer came chopping up through all that brush and stuff. And I thought somebody was running up the edge of that ravine. I mean, it was a racket. And I sat up and I was about to yell out and all of a sudden up pops that deer right over the edge stops looks at me and it was like something out of a cartoon those front legs screeched to a halt and those back legs just kept chopping up the soil and it was like a the legs are spinning in the cartoon but they're not actually moving for about a second and then it just made a command decision it's going to just keep on charging straight ahead so that thing tore right through my campsite and took off into the woods and i wish that i had my camera going for that but you know, sometimes it's those special, one-of-a-kind moments that are just meant for you. Well, I heard a quote one time, your gear is only as good as it helps you sleep. And that stuck with me. It bounced around in my head for the last couple of years. And if that's true, then my gear is pretty darn good because I had a great night in the George Bettinger camp last night. I'm real happy about some recent purchases I've made when it comes to 18th century gear. These socks here and these blankets that I've got, 
these are going to open up half the calendar to my being able to get out and explore this hobby in the winter time, in the late fall, the early spring when it's wet and cold. I can't wait for some of those grueling outdoor experiences in this hobby because I really think it's gonna take me leaps and bounds ahead of where I am today. So let's talk about some of this gear that is opening up the calendar like that, that's gonna enable all this growth. These wool blankets are done by a gentleman named Rob Stone. I've mentioned him a few times already. He has been recommended to me for years as the man when it comes to blankets in the 18th century. He spent years documenting these things. He's got the materials nailed. And uh, most importantly, he's weaving them by hand and you just don't get more authentic than that. This particular blanket, and I've got two of these, you can see the second was a part of my bedroll. This particular blanket is a French two and a half point trade blanket. It would have been authentic for about this region and this time period. Uh, and then I've got what he refers to as the trade duffel here that my camp is pitched under. These are what's going to enable me to get out into the winter time. But it's not just the blankets and the blankets wouldn't be enough to do that. There's a little bit of other equipment that you got to have. And if you can get it in wool and you can get it handmade, authentic to the time period, documentable, you can really, really level up your gear. That's what I did with these socks, this hat. I got a pair of mittens in my market wallet there that I didn't quite need for this camp, but you're going to see them this winter. These socks here are done by South Union Mills, as is the hat, the mittens. I just can't say enough about these. Last night I had sweaty feet in my bedroll with these. And I woke up this morning and I was sitting here for a minute or two thinking about how there's these accounts of Washington's boys at Valley Forge leaving bloody footprints in the snow with their bare feet in the middle of the winter time. And their feet are all cut up, black toes, awful, awful frostbite. Fortunately, you get a pair of socks like these, you won't ever have to face that. You won't have to deal with losing toes to the winter cold. We're leveling up, we're doing things right, and uh, I'm moving forward with a really, really great kit. And after this particular camp experience, I really do think that I'm prepared to get out into the winter time. So, I was only comfortable in this camp because I had the right gear to stay warm. Blankets, socks, mittens, and a hat. The shelter wasn't doing me any favors and it certainly would not be my top pick in the winter time. But it did just fine for the fall and I'm excited to give it a shot in the summertime and maybe under some spring rain. Because most importantly, it kept the water off. I don't necessarily like the fact that had it rained harder, I would have been lugging around a wet mop the next day. You should always try and keep your wool dry, but barring any kind of natural shelter, at least I would have gotten some good sleep. There are a couple of things that I could have done differently. I could have dropped the back down to keep the breeze out. It actually ended up helping me in this case because I had to cool off throughout the night. And having a proper bed of leaves underneath me would have also kept me warmer, but it wasn't really necessary because of the high temperature on this camp. More poles could have been preferred in a real storm because as the blanket got a little damp on the outside it started to sag and when I woke up it was brushing my face, but it didn't have much impact on a mostly dry night. And so all in all this was a really pretty comfortable setup, and most importantly it's historically accurate. Let me give one more big shout out to Nathan Kobach. You could spend years reading pretty boring source material looking for little nuggets like the description of this camp, but guys like Kobuck save you that time and help that interesting stuff percolate to the top for the betterment of everybody in the hobby. If you haven't seen the Buffalo Trace 1765 blog, you've got a lot of reading to catch up on. Well, there's some other things that I would really like to talk about. One of those is authenticity. I've spent the last really two or three years of my college journey working really hard to improve this kit. I've spent a lot of time in actual period sources, which I can't recommend enough. But more importantly, I've sought out mentors who have a lot more experience than I do. At times, I've paid money to go to classes like the NMLRA gunsmithing seminar at Western Kentucky University. I was fortunate to get a university grant to attend that seminar where I built this flintlock. There are all kinds of different avenues that you can take to improve your gear and if you really start to intentionally work towards improving your kit and making sure that you are as authentic as you can be you also run the risk of working so hard to become good at this hobby that you no longer enjoy it and i think that that's true for a lot of things i think that it's true for different people in this hobby. There really seem to be three demographics. There are those who are perfectly willing to wear modern shoes, for example, as a compromise for comfort when they're out in the woods that might otherwise wear a pretty authentic kit. There are those on the other extreme who are hand sewing everything, who insist on producing almost all of their gear by their own hands so that they can ensure that every variable was not only done with the correct materials, but was also done in a period correct fashion. 
And then there are people who are more in the middle, kind of like myself, who have made some compromises where it seems reasonable. In my case, for example, this hunting shirt is machine sewn by an actual seamstress who knew what they were doing. This is better quality than I could have produced at the time that I bought it, but it still is not completely perfect for the time period being machine sewn. And when you start to really dig and start looking around at the gear, you can see that this was done on a sewing machine. But some of my clothing is hand sewn, my moccasins, my leggings. I've collected a couple of things like these garters that are really top quality done by fantastic artisans. This flintlock is very accurate to the time period. Wallace Gussler helped me build it. There are all kinds of funny compromises right now with my gear my equipment and I'm slowly moving towards the meticulously perfect hand sewn absolute pinnacle best that I can be in this hobby but I'm intentionally moving slowly like I said earlier I don't want this hobby to become something that is excruciating for me to have to go out into the woods and film a video I want to be happy when I'm out here. I want to go to sleep with a smile on my face. I want to wake up excited to be in front of the camera sharing some of the insights that I gained while I was you know, testing new gear the day before or while I was sleeping in new blankets that night. I really want to preserve this excitement. And to do that, I'm very slowly moving forward. There are not going to be giant leaps really beyond this point in authenticity. I might hand sew a shirt in the near future. I might make a pair of breeches in uh, 18th century fashion and slowly begin to work my way towards complete authenticity. But I don't want to do that too quickly. I don't want to rob myself of the joy of pursuing this hobby. If you've made it this far in this video, let me just say thank you. Start your comment with the word buffalo so I know that you made it to the end. And if you'd like to check out more from Frontier Trading Company, you can visit my new website, FrontierTradingCompany.org. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, take care.